My name is Eric Cole and today we're going to talk about Frozen 2 and how it failed to be as memorable as its predecessor. And spoiler warning, I will be discussing extensive spoilers on all the films that I touch on in this video, so you've been spoiler warned. And before we get started, you might already know that I spend a lot of time watching, thinking and talking about films, so it only seems right for me to actually go ahead and make a film. I am putting together a drama sci-fi short film called The First Time I Never Met You. And if you want to stay updated or are curious about the process, click the link in the video description below and sign up to our mailing list for some exclusive content and updates before they hit the web. But for now, let's just jump back into it. So in 2019, Disney gave us a C Equal to the ever so popular Frozen, which had already set the bar pretty high with its two Academy Award wins, a BAFTA and Golden Globe Award, a 90% score on Rotten Tomatoes, and of course, the part that we all know. Let it go, let it go. And as annoying as the song may have become to some, okay, to a lot of people, the fact that it was sung, shared, played over and over and over speaks volumes as to the film's ability to elicit emotion and feelings in its audience. And to quote Maya Angelou, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So Frozen 2 comes out, it hits the big screen and they've got a lot going for it. The animation is great and they do some really clever things with the music. They've got this sequence at the start of the film where Elsa hears this mysterious voice. No, not that one. Yeah, that one. It's a strange and unknown voice that Elsa tries to communicate with via singing. And the more she connects with the voice, the more in tune the voice becomes with her singing. The film made $1.4 billion at the box office, making it the highest grossing animated film of all times, which means a lot of people have seen it. But it seems that the impact it had on its audience and popular culture in general was a lot less significant. It feels like the sequel came and went with nowhere near as many people raving or singing about it. Why is that? Well, I want to suggest that it's because of how Frozen 2 handled its inner journey. Um, inner journey? Yep, let's talk about it. So author and story consultant Michael Haig elaborated in one of his lectures that good movies will have an outer journey run through them. But the outstanding movies look at story in an additional way, in what I call the inner journey of the character. So, the outer journey is the one that will take the protagonist on their way towards achieving a visible goal, also referred to as an outer or external goal. It could be a prince trying to find a bride in foreign land, or a child trying to prevent his alien best friend from being taken away. You can visibly see whether those goals have been achieved or not. By the end of Coming to America, Akeem marries the woman he fell in love with. And by the end of E.T. the Extraterrestrial, Elliot successfully prevents the authorities from taking E.T. away. One way to elevate the quality and depth of the story is to weave in an inner journey. If the outer journey is a pursuit of an outer or external goal, the inner journey is the pursuit, whether willing or not, of their inner goal. It's not a tangible or visible goal, but rather a personal, emotional, or psychological goal. You can't point at it, you can't look at it. So what does it look like then? Let's break it all down. The character will have suffered some wound before the events of the film or very early on in the film. Akeem's wound stems from living a life in which his every needs are catered for, leaving him with no say or influence over his own life. Elliot's wound stems from his parents' separation, after which his father, who Elliot was particularly close to, moved to a different country. Dad would believe me. That wound will be responsible for a fear that the protagonist can't quite get over. Akeem fears not being able to live a fulfilling life. Elliot fears being left behind. And that fear creates a lie that the protagonist tells themselves in order to stay safe from what they fear. Akeem believes he must defy tradition in order to live his life. Elliot believes he must impose his relevance in other people's lives in order to not be left behind. Well, I'm ready to now a thief. To play. I'm ready to play now, you guys. That lie is what Michael Haig refers to as the character's identity, the version of themselves which they have created 
in order to stay safe from what they fear. And it is because they live within their identity that they are unsatisfied and unfulfilled with who they are. So the inner journey is what will take the protagonist from living within their identity to living within their essence, which is the version of themselves that they could be if they faced their fears and lived courageously. Akeem's inner journey takes him from defying tradition to living his own life within tradition. Elliot's inner journey goes from forcing his presence on others to being able to let go and say goodbye. But the story truly becomes great when both journeys work together in harmony, when the obstacles faced in the outer journey directly affect the inner journey and vice versa. When Akeem arrives in New York, the first visible obstacle he understands he needs to overcome is how out of place he looks. So he tries to blend in by changing his external appearance, which also affects his inner journey as he further rejects his traditions in the process. A way to make sure that both journeys work together is to render the protagonist unable to achieve their external goal until they've left their identity behind and embraced their essence. Only then can they become the person that is fully equipped to achieve the external goal and sometimes even outgrow it. It isn't until Akeem is honest about who he really is that he is able to be honest with Lisa, which was the one gesture that made it possible for him to be with someone who loves him for who he is. And it isn't until Elliot is able to let go and learns to say goodbye that he is able to free E.T. from the authorities and send him home. And that's where Frozen 2 tried to do things a little bit differently. Elsa's magic has endangered the people close to her more than once, which has emotionally wounded her. She fears that her magic, which is an intrinsic part of who she is, will hurt the people she loves. So she lies to herself in that she must inhibit who she is. That's the lie that keeps her safe from facing her fears. That's her identity. And the film sets the stage for an inner journey that will see her essence being the version of her that is openly and proudly being herself. And if that sounds familiar, that's because it is. Those are the same inner problems that she faces in the first film. So Elsa sets off on an outer journey to save Arendelle from the spirits of the forest. And as expected, along the way, her external struggles directly affect her inner journey. So far, so good. She opens up to Usher, sorry, to the magical voice that calls her, but it causes the elements to threaten the town, so she decides to do something about it. On her way to find answers about the magic of the realm, a magical fire gets in the way. She uses her magic, but also her empathy, two traits that define who she is as a person, to reach out and settle the fire gecko. But in turn, it attracts the stone giants, so she leaves and cracks on with her quest. She embraces her new ability to access memories stored in water, but discovers that her parents died trying to find the same answers she is currently seeking. So she sends Anna away and continues the quest by herself. Elsa reaches Atahalan where she finds the answers that she'd been seeking. The magical voice that she was trying to connect with but also feared was in fact her own inner voice. She literally tells the voice, And Atta Hallen replies that Elsa herself is the one that she's been waiting for. You are the one you've been waiting for all of So all along, that magical voice was a physical and visual representation of Elsa's essence, which is why it's all the more satisfying to finally see her step into her power and become all that she should and could be. And that cathartic moment falls flat when Elsa is frozen out of commission only to pass the torch to Anna in order to achieve the external goal. See, the outer journey is what put Elsa on her own inner journey. We've seen her become the person that can solve the problem only for the problem to be solved by someone else. She went and took us with her through this entire transformation, only to serve as damage control. After Anna uses the stone men to destroy the dam, causing the water to burst through, restoring the balance of magic, but also creating a deluge which heads straight for Arendelle, Elsa comes back just in time to save it. But at that point, it's already been evacuated. There isn't a person in there to save, and we now know that Arendelle was built off the back of her ancestors sister's crimes against the Nofodra people because they were different. Elsa's newfound self and powers are used to save the thing that we care about the least at that point in the story. 
The film builds all this dramatic tension only to waste it away. Now, some people might argue that her essence was actually the version of herself that can actually trust her sister. And that's an argument that does have some merit because the film does play around with the idea of Elsa wanting to keep her sister close and then pushing her away. And by the end, she does entrust her sister to finish what she started. But what I would say to that is that that climatic scene where she becomes who she is supposed to be, where she learns to accept herself and listen to her own inner voice, had nothing to do with her sister or, you know, learning to trust her or learning to let people in or any of that. It was all about Elsa accepting herself for who and what she is. And so Elsa trusting her sister with this humongous task feels a bit sudden, it feels unearned. And even though logically it does make some sort of sense, it becomes of lesser emotional importance. But it's how you made them feel. That's what people will remember. And Frozen 2 seems to have dropped the ball of emotional tension when it comes to making the audience feel something worth remembering. As a conclusion, Frozen 2 had a lot going for it. From already known and beloved characters, great animation, and clever use of music in a narrative context. All of these things made it a largely enjoyable experience, but it seems it wasn't quite enough to make it a widely memorable one. But what did you think about Frozen 2? Have you seen it? Do you think that inner journeys even matter? And did the film leave a lasting impression on you? Drop a comment below and let me know. Thank you.